King's Troop, Royal Horse Artillery, ride to Hyde Park. Their duty, the firing of a 56-gun salute, one round for each year of the late King's life. At the tower, the salute is fired by the Honourable Artillery Company. One rain has ended, a rain begins. At London Airport, waiting to meet Queen Elizabeth II, are the Duke of Gloucester and Lord Mountbatten. The Prime Minister is there, and the leader of the opposition. With members of Her Majesty's government, all await the Queen's arrival. Her tour cut short by the tragic passing of her father, Queen Elizabeth leaves the Argonaut. There is no ceremony, but all thoughts for her at this sorrowful homecoming. She knows she has the true sympathy and loyal support of her ministers and her people. Philip, she thanks the crew of the Argonaut for their services. The arrival, the greetings and the handshakes all quickly over are followed by the drive to a capital in mourning. Next day, St. James's Palace was the scene of the reading of the proclamation following the Queen's attendance at the Accession Council meeting. In the presence of the Duke of Norfolk, Earl Marshal, the proclamation was read by the Garter King of Arms, Sir George Bellew. With one voice and consent of tongue and heart, publish and proclaim that the high and mighty Princess Elizabeth Alexandra Mary is now, by the death of our late sovereign of happy memory, become Queen Elizabeth II, by the grace of God, Queen of this realm, and of all her... The historic proclamation was also made at other points in the capital. Large crowds heard it read at Charing Cross, and there was a similar ceremony at Temple Bar. Many Londoners also gathered near the Royal Exchange to hear it read there. King of Arms, Sir Arthur Cochrane, officiated. The proclamation ending. God save the Queen. <laughs> Queen Elizabeth II was born in April 1926, and from birth she was third in line of succession to the throne. At no time could pictures of her early life and upbringing be more appropriate than now at the moment of her accession. Many will remember these pictures of her as a little girl, and as we look at them again, we see how natural a charm they express. She was brought up with the greatest care and affection, but also, as Queen Mary is reported to have said, she was brought up sensibly. At a naval review, she learnt about ships from Lord Louis Mountbatten. On regal occasions, as for instance at her father's coronation, she was regal too. A picture this of special historic interest, for now her own coronation lies ahead. Equally delightful pictures are those that show her enjoying happy days at home. Then, as she grew up, the emphasis was on service and duty. For example, she underwent the training of a sea ranger. Watch. Shut. Watch is proved ready for inspection. Thank you, Brayford. Her sister was, of course, her constant companion, and the measure of freedom and relaxation that they enjoyed together was always a feature of her life at this time. 
she came of age at 18. Yes. It was at this period that she acted as counselor of state. Already, her royal duties began to multiply. It was after her father's tour to South Africa that the joyful news of her engagement to Prince Philip was announced. They had first met when they were children, but as yet the prince was scarcely known to the people of Britain. Their wedding was acclaimed by nation and commonwealth, and in the years that followed, her consort quickly won the esteem and affection of the country. Their son was born in November 1948, and early pictures of Prince Charles, now heir apparent to the throne, underline the joy of his parents. Their happiness was shared by the people of Britain, and this picture turns, so to speak, a new page in the royal family album. When later the king's illness prevented his attending the trooping ceremony, his daughter deputized for him. It was an occasion that laid stress on the fact that more and more she was already undertaking the public duties that fall to a sovereign. Then came the tremendously successful tour of Canada and the homecoming. Watching the affectionate greetings, we also remember the strenuous nature of the task that had just been carried out. We remember too that it was one example of the fulfillment of a promise. For some years earlier, Her Majesty, speaking then as heiress presumptive, had made her declaration of service to the nation. It is well that we should listen to it again. I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service and to the service of our great imperial family to which we all belong. But I shall not have strength to carry out this resolution alone unless you join in it with me, as I now invite you to do. I know that your support will be unfailingly given. God help me to make good my vow, and God bless all of you who are willing to share in it. <laughs> 